In this video, I'm going to tell you the five things you must do when hiring a developer as a non-technical founder. What's going on guys? It's Kevin from Solopreneur. And in this video, I'm going to share some of the things I've learned by developing or having multiple products developed by uh, by external developers. I myself do have a bit of a technical background. I'm primarily a digital marketer and entrepreneur more on the business and marketing side, but um, I have worked with developers before, but I'm certainly not a developer. I can do some scrappy things, but not a developer. So I'll give you a share some of the products that I built. Uh, actually, this is one of them, a B2B sales application, outsourced half of the development. I actually had a co-founder with this one highly complicated application uh, yeah, since we've since moved on from the product but this was over a year of development uh, spent almost forty thousand dollars so uh, it was a lot a lot of learnings there a lot of mistakes i made so happy to share some of that more recently you're looking at uh, a new product i built it's a uh, resort comparison site so it has a number of features it's all uh, uh, uses JavaScript, the backend node serverless architecture. So it looks like a simple website, but actually it's all custom. There's backend stuff, integrations with a database. So this is my newest product. Spent maybe one tenth of what I spent on the last one using some of these tips, guys. So um, I want to share some of those learnings. And even with this one, I made a mistake recently that I want to make sure you guys avoid. So I'm going to share all of that with you guys. So let's jump right into it. So the first thing you want to do is you have to research the tech stack or the architecture. Now, some of you guys might be getting scared of that, but let me explain what I mean. Software products are built using things called technology stacks. So basically, there's various components to it. Here's a great article that goes over it. I'll link it in the description, but essentially, there is the programming languages, the frameworks, the database, and the server. So if you look at something like Facebook, we just looked at Airbnb. This is what they're using. They're using JS, they're using Ruby, Ruby on Rails right here, MySQL database, Amazon RDS, all of this. You see right here, Facebook, this is the stack they're using. Uh, Pinterest, so very common stacks. So you can kind of look at this list and kind of get a sense. Now these are huge startups, but just know that there are a lot of different technologies. There are some of them like Python are super old, but very stable and, you know, Postgres and uh, SQL here in Python, very old, very stable. Some of them are newer backend technologies like Node and JavaScript. So there's so many things. So guys, you don't need to go learn what all of these technologies, you know, learn how to program or develop in any of these technologies. But you must understand what they are and generally speaking, what they want to do. You have to at least have some kind of opinion on what program language you want to use, what framework, what database, and what server. Now, some simple Googling, it might take you a day of research, but there's tons of information out there, guys, so just... The, and each of these technologies have their own advantages. These are very common stacks, but you want to get an, at least an idea because depending on the direction you go, first of all, depending on what you're trying to build, there are certain technologies are going to be better than other technologies. So depending on the level of interactivity, depending on what kinds of integrations you need, what kinds of, uh, what kind of scalability, what uh, stability, so many things, you know, what data sources you're pulling from, so many things. So if you choose the wrong stack, it won't work. And what's even worse is if you just go to a developer and you're like, hey, I got this idea. I came up while drinking half a bottle of tequila. Can you just build this for me? Do you use magic and pixie dust? Or, you know, like you have no idea how they're going to be building this. Then they might, first of all, they're going to take you for a ride because they think you're a dummy that, you know, you don't know. And they might just do the scrappiest just the thing that they're most comfortable with or rather than what's the right tech stack, right? Because every developer is just going to tell you they can do anything. So if you know you're hiring, say, a Ruby and a Rails developer, that's very, that changes very differently than if you're hiring like someone who's using uh, more front-end tech like JavaScript and maybe Django or whatever it is. So the point being is Almost every developer is just going to tell you they can do anything because they just want to get the work and it's so competitive. But 
knowing what you're going for up front is going to really help you eliminate who not to hire. So that's the first thing. Also, if you guys can get access to a friend who is a developer, maybe you have a friend who works you know, as a full-time developer, maybe they don't have the time to develop for you or help you with your app, but hopefully you can put this in front of them and say, hey, God, hey, this is what I'm thinking. What, do you, what tech stack do you think makes sense for me? Like, what are some options I should consider? And they'll be able to guide you if you don't have a friend. Maybe you can just post in some forums online. Guys, I cannot stress the, the importance of first figuring this out. If I know you're hiring someone technical because you're not technical, but this is a must know. You have to know the basics. So that's number one, and I see a lot of people skip this and get burned. So now number two is you have to design the MVP of the MVP. So it comes down to scope, right? So Uber didn't start with all the features that you see today. Facebook didn't start. Pinterest didn't start. None of these products, uh, I'm giving common examples, but none of these products started with the product you're using today. There's a, there's a concept, it's called a minimum viable product. It's called an MVP. If you're not familiar with this product, with this term, please, there are so many great entrepreneurship books, but if you're doing a, any sort of technology startup or business or product, please do yourself a favor and read like the first three or four chapters of this. If you can't get through the whole thing, if you hate reading or something, get the audiobook. That's what I like. But the point being is you really have to understand this concept of the minimum viable product, which means that you, you want to build the, the simplest, cheapest thing that'll get the job done. That'll validate the assumption you have that whatever new widget app or whatever you're building will actually work. Because it doesn't matter if you build, say, uh, 10 features and it's a terrible idea, or you just build the two must need, most needed minimum features to, and it's a terrible idea. Why would you have spent the other eight time and money building the other eight if the core two features were garbage to begin with and the product is not good? So... The point is, you really want to make, you want to define what your M, what your MVP is. So very important. So what, and then once you do that, then what you want to do is you want to actually create a clickable prototype. So now we've gotten to the feet. So let me just back up for one second and say, so now you've said, you know, you want all of these hundred things that your app can do, and you have the grand vision for what it'll be in five years. But no, let's talk about what it can do today, right? So if it's an app to do five things, what is the one or two unique things it does that, you know, and what are the three, say, are nice-to-haves rather than must-haves? So again, I'm going to link the book down if, you, if you're not familiar with the concept. I really think you should read the first few chapters if you can't even get through the whole book. But um, it's going to save you a ton of time and money and re really reframe your thinking. So the next thing you want to do as part of this is you want to design a clickable prototype or at least some wireframes. So here's a tool I'm using, UX Pin, just gives you an idea. Just draw out the major pages. As you can see here I've done, I've taken the time to go out and draw, like I showed you, some of the major interactions. Really think it through. And when you're having to design each of these screens, that's going to force you to really pare this down because you don't want to build this thing. Imagine if you who are using a tool like this, which is just drag and drop, click and put it stuff in, or if you're using PowerPoint, just drawing boxes. Imagine how time consuming that is for you. Imagine actually programming all of that, right? So this is going to force you to pare it down. Also, you want to have detailed notes of the interactions. What happens when you click this? What happens when you click this? Now that sounds, I know what most people are thinking. That sounds like a lot of work. It is, but this is the point. If you do this, then the developer is going to have a really concise understanding of what it is that you're building. It's not debatable because what developers do is most people give them an idea on the back of a napkin. They're filling in 90% of the gaps in their head and they're just adding padding in their quote because they don't know because they don't know the whole scope, right? Like imagine if someone asks you to build a new app like Uber or something. You have no idea how long that's going to take if you're a developer because you don't know what all the other features this person is thinking about. So here it's a very clear scope. 
They have most of the major, you don't have to do all the tiny screens like the login screen, the this, the that. No, like the major interactions, which should cover 80% of your app and then your developer, the developer will be able to give you a realistic quote. And if they can't, then they're not the right person you want to work with because they're not an honest person, right? So the next thing you want to do is you want to make sure you get obviously a few different quotes because then now you're dealing apples to apples. You have a very defined scope, so people aren't kind of, this person gave me a double the price, but I don't know what their interpretation is because you know every, it's all in their head and all I gave them was a one sentence explainer that you know I'm trying to build Uber for pizza or something, right? No, it's, you, it, this is a very defined scope and then that's gonna help you. So the next thing, number three, so we went through you have to research the architecture. Number two, you have to figure out your scope, the MVP, create a clickable prototype with all the intentions. So, so far you haven't spent one penny, right? So that's the good news. And you might even find that you might stop here and say, well, man, this isn't a great idea. I can't figure it out. Or you might refine your idea in this stage and it might even be better than what you thought. So that's why this is also a good exercise. The next thing you want to do is you want to, there are many different kinds of developers, right? You can hire an entire firm that's used to doing enterprise application development. So you can hire a firm, they're going to have the whole DevOps process, they're going to have a UX designer, they're going to have multiple, uh, you know, developers, they're going to have sprint planners, planners, they're going to, they're going to have all of these roles that are in an enterprise market development situation and you're gonna pay for that, right? And they're gonna build this application like they're building a scalable application. That's not what you want when you're getting started. What you want is a scrappy developer who's not, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's going to, going to be quick. You want someone who can develop MVPs, who, have, who has, and like I mentioned this term, you wanna know about it. You want someone who has experience developing MVPs. So make sure you check for, portfolios, make, make sure you get references, make sure that this person has done it. And I say this person because you want to hire something called a full stack developer. That means someone knows how to do things end to end. Now, they're not the best at everything. No developer is going to be great at front end, back end, service side, all of that. But you want someone who can do, they're going to have their strong points, but you want someone who can launch the application end to end for you. Alternatively, maybe you could find a really scrappy agency, but I would stay away from agencies. But, you know, I wouldn't completely, if you get quotes, maybe you can get a scrappy agency who can do that for you. But again, I would say, so number three was you got to make sure you're hiring the right developer for the job. So you need to hire someone scrappy and maybe in the future, you, you know, who's still going to write good scalable code, but um, yeah, so you want to hire the right type of developer. Number four is, and this is when I just got burned on this product I just made here. You need to get a code repository, so something like GitHub. And what this is, is basically just hosts all the code for you because developers write code on their local computer. And then if you don't have somewhere where they can give you the code, then they're just going to keep it on their computer. Maybe they'll email you the code. But, the, but that's not a very smart way of doing this, especially if one developer leaves and you need to bring another one in. There's versioning, there's branching. I won't get into all of that, but just know this, that you need access to your code. And the standard way to do this is to store your code in these repositories. And GitHub is one example, but there's so many other uh, repositories you can use. But I can tell you a quick story. And you need to be on your developers to upload their latest builds. So I've been working for a developer for a long time. He's really good. One time he forgot to upload the latest build. Then I can't find him anymore. So that's the current situation. I can't find him anymore. So the next developer who worked on it, he, he worked with the old code base. So then features were lost. We had to roll it back. So really important that you stay on top of your developers and you make sure every time you fit, ship a feature, a bug fix, a version, anything, hey, did you upload the code to GitHub? Did you, do I have the latest version? Annoying, but this is what you have to do. And the final tip I have for you, and I saved it for last because it's actually my favorite, is the best way to save on building an app or building your software product is don't do it at all because you may, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying you may not need to do it yet. Most people, like I said, you know, they 
have a, a night out drinking, or I'm joking, but whatever they're doing and they come up with this great app idea, or maybe they do have a really good idea and insight from industry. Maybe you've worked in a certain industry and you're like, hey, you know what, I've, I've noticed this, this deficiency. I actually think that this solution is not addressed by the current market uh, uh, products in the market, and I really think it would be good. So either way, however you came up with your idea, hopefully the latter, um, it's still not validated, right? So again, if you read the and the Lean Startup book, it'll talk through validation. Really important you understand this. But again, I want to give you a tangible example. Using a product called Lead Pages, what I did when I was building this uh, resort site I showed you is I actually just simply made a landing page. So I'll actually show you. I actually made two rounds of landing pages. So what I did was, for example, when I first got started, all I did was I made this landing page in 10 minutes using lead pages. Lead pages is awesome. No development, nothing. You just click around and you drag things like you can see here. I'll leave a link for it too. All I did was I typed out like, hey, what's this page going to be about? Sign up for early access and do some Facebook ads at it and see if I get any signups. If you can't get any signups, then you need to reevaluate. Well, is this app really working? You know, is it your value proposition? Do you need to tweak your language? But you want to get some traction, right? Then the next thing I did was, okay, so I know that people w want something the way I described it, but what about the actual interaction I'm thinking, like the way I'm thinking of developing the idea? So then what I did was, like I mentioned, I created that clickable prototype. So I went off, made another la landing page, and this time I just screen recorded my clickable prototype. I'll uh, play it here and see, and I did the same, you know, same Facebook ads a little later to see if now that people can see how the product's going to work, you know, this is just a clickable prototype. There, there's no app. It's just like going through pages, like slides, one after another kind of thing, right? It's, there, it's There's no animations. To see and just voiceover. Things you care about. You can make better resorts like So I actually hired a professional voiceover actor to do this. I wrote him the script on Fiverr. It was like like 20 bucks or something. So I also dropped a link to Fiverr. So a lot of cheap, scrappy ways to do all of this, guys, before you even get into the thousands of building apps. Right? So once I had done those two tests and I said, okay, you know what? I think I have enough in information here. And also, because these people emailed me, I mean, gave me their email addresses. I personally emailed them and said, hey, listen, we're developing this product right now. I just want to understand what is it about the product that you found useful? What are some things you would like to see? Not everyone's going to respond to you, but just getting that validation. And if you get someone who's really excited, every build or every little milestone, you can kick it in front of them and get real customer feedback. You might even get early customers if it's a paying product um, up front. So... That's it, guys. Bit of a ramble, lots of information to share, but those are real world, um, real world uh, tips for you guys because I've seen some people talk about this topic, but it's always from the software developer standpoint. It's always from the agency standpoint, so they always have an agenda. So no agenda for me, guys. Is I just want everyone to avoid getting burned. This is really important. So uh, and the last thing I'll say is if you can find a technical co-founder that's you know that can be preferred sometimes if you really don't have any money but just know that once you get a partner that person has to have the right the right personality as well so it's you know it's not it's not all you know sometimes people talk about never outsource development but that's not always the case so there is pros and cons to both sides that's outside the scope of this video but i uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you found it informative you know you know, uh, drop your comments, um, give me a like, really helps the channel out. And I personally, personally appreciate it. It motivates me to keep making these videos for you guys and uh, like and subscribe. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. I'm making videos, uh, multiple videos weekly. So we'll see you in the next one.